Welcome to this week's Wednesday webinar. And again, we're going to be talking about Cottage Airbnb 101 with our special guest, Kyle Ford. So I'll just give you guys a quick little overview of what we'll be talking about today. So um, we're going to have a little riff about these Cottage Airbnbs, and then we're going to have a question and answer, have a few updates and announcements for you guys. And then I'm going to update y'all on the off market deals. So um, Adam, why don't you give us a little intro here and kick things off? Yeah, so welcome back, everybody. If this is your first time actually running into us, uh, who we are is we actually go out and find off-market properties for people. So I own and operate one of Canada's largest wholesaling businesses, which actually goes out and identifies needs on private market, um, on private off-market real estate deals. And what we do is we usually go and, and go ahead for you and do the negotiation portion. So we'll often do a lot of the due diligence on the after repair value, the fair market value, the renovation costs, uh, as well as negotiating and actually creating that contract. So we go, we secure an interest in the property, and then we actually assign that interest in the property. So um, my name is Adam J.D. Martin. I'm a 26-year-old real estate investor here in London, Ontario. And our business and our operations are actually now sprawled across basically all of Ontario. So uh, we're servicing just about everywhere. And we're currently marketing um, basically all of that like Georgian Bay kind of horseshoe that it is, um, as well as getting into the Northeast. And then we've obviously got current marketing spreading from Windsor to east of Toronto uh, for our actual established wholesaling business. So I've been in real estate for the last three years, which is not a long time. Uh, but I've actually been able to do some really creative deals. So in my time, I've been able to do student rentals, house hacking, which is where I live for free inside of the house that I was renting. I've been able to do Airbnbs. I've done Airbnbs in really creative ways as well, where I did a private room in a shared house. I also combined an Airbnb with a student rental that I was living in. So a house hack, student rental, Airbnb. Um, I've then also done a little bit of multifamily real estate investing. I've done flips. I've done the bird. I'm a mortgage agent. I've lent out millions of dollars of, uh, of private capital. So I've done just about everything in the space in a very short amount of time. And uh, I currently also do a lot of teaching, mentoring, talking on Cashflow Tribe Canada, which is one of the largest educational brands uh, in Canada for sure that teaches people how to invest in real estate. So that's a little bit about what I've done. And tonight we've actually brought on Kyle Ford, who's done a lot more in the space of cottage Airbnbs. Um, I actually have no experience with cottage Airbnbs other than staying at them occasionally. Um, and so uh, this whole webinar is really about how you make sense of that. And I'm gonna let Kyle do an intro, but I'm also gonna kick it off with my first question for Kyle is just, how, how do we go about evaluating these deals? Like, what is step one, right? Which is like, how do I identify what cottage might be a good deal? What Airbnb might make sense for me? And, uh, and how I might actually go about investing in that thing. Because we just assigned our first cottage deal and it's actually been taking us a long time to identify great deals and, and, and really establish like, what is this thing worth, right? So I'll let you do your intro there, Kyle, but that's kind of where I want to start with is how do we get started in even looking at these cottages? Yeah, for sure. Uh, happy to answer that question. Just a little bit about myself. I've been investing for eight years now. Uh, started with the single family rentals, uh, pre-construction condo, uh, moved into uh, smaller multifamily, specifically focusing on the burr. My first deal, I was scared to put a coat of paint on. Uh, I had no construction experience. Uh, I went from that, from doing major renovations uh, on large multifamily building, buildings. And now we've moved more into the development space. Uh, so we're, we have about, two, uh, about almost 200 units in total that we're developing right now. Um, so really moved into that space. And then a, a lot in the private lending as well. Uh, I focused on helping families and investors acquire properties using private capital. So uh, really, really the, the broad spectrum, spectrum of investing. Uh, I made my first cottage investment right on that Georgian Bay horseshoe that you're talking about, Adam, just north of Wyerton. Um, it was a cottage that I bought for $325,000 um, with a $292,000 vendor take back mortgage. So that was pretty exciting. That was my first deal. And full transparency, Adam, that I didn't run a cash flow calculation on that deal. 
That, to me, it was just about, can I cover my expenses? Because I really want a free cottage. I didn't, it wasn't an investment decision for me. It was a lifestyle decision. And I just wanted to cover my, my expenses. From there, I stopped wanting to go to the cottage because it was making so much money from me not being there. And, and that's when it really hit the nail on the head to me. Like, there's something here. Like, the, these, these cottages are going for a lot of money. So to put it into perspective, five years ago, I was renting that cottage for 12 to 15, 12 to 1300 a week. Uh, that same cottage is close to $3,000 per week now. Um, so really, really explosive growth in, in the, the cottage rental space. To talk about your question, Adam, uh, about how do I d identify? Um, the, great, the one thing I love about the cottage market is there are torn, rundown shacks next to million dollar properties. Yeah. So if we've heard the term flipping into the neighborhood, identifying a property in an area where you can buy under value and flip into it. I really like the value add section of, of multi of, of, of cottages, pardon me, uh, that I can increase the value and there's good comps to support it. So that's one thing that I look for. Uh, in the beginning, like I said, it was a lifestyle decision. I wasn't, wasn't concerned about what my ARV was going to be. I just wanted to pay the bills and have a cottage. Uh, now at the point of my business, we, uh, we currently have nine cottages. Uh, we have two lots that we're building into, um, into new cottages, as well as we just bought a 15 unit motel that we are converting into eight executive cottage style suites that we are going to be operating. So, uh, now it's, it's really about, you know, going back to our core investment philosophies. What are my expenses? What are my income? Can I cash flow this? Um, expenses are, are a little bit higher on cottage rentals. You have cleaning on a weekly maintenance. You have furnishing and furnishing repair expenses. These are the things that are going to add up a little bit that you need to be factoring into your numbers. Another conversation, you start doing over $30,000 a year in cottage rental income, HST applicable guys. So there's some tax and corporate structure that you want to look into as well. But for me, it's about buying a property in, a, in an area that I can add significant value right away to. Absolutely. No, that's, uh, that's incredible that you, uh, Adam, if, if uh, you want to unmute yourself there, we actually can't hear you. Um, so that's really incredible that you've done such a scope of uh, properties. And, and I'm, I'm really interested to hear more about this executive Airbnb cottage suite that you've got going on. So like, how did you stumble upon this and, and what actually made you jump, jump into this? Well, I, I want to get you excited about it first because I think this is an incredible opportunity. Um, the, the, the motel section is dying. And there, there's rundown motels all across North America and even the world. And whether you're looking at converting those to potentially long-term residential or taking a more investor-focused approach to, op to operating them. Most of these hotel operators tend to be the, that boomer age uh, and not to not not to generalize here, but he does the repairs, she cleans. Seems to be the scenario that we're seeing there, um, and they're they're working at this as their job. And the way I want to operate it is no staff. So we're converting them into suites where we're running just like you would if you had a condo Airbnb or a cottage. You have lockbox check-in, pre-emailed instructions. You you can time the door codes, so they don't need to go to the front desk. I don't know about you guys, but I hate going to the front desk at a hotel. They want to, you know, I, I can look on my phone where your gym is. I don't need to talk to you about the amenities. Give me the room key. Let me in. I want to go have a drink. So we want to eliminate that process um, and, and run that more virtual style. Uh, we're calling them condo cottages. That's kind of our, I'm going to coin that term for now. So <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so when identifying the deal, I guess, sorry, I had muted myself there earlier, but I guess what I'm looking at is like, sometimes we're running into these cottages, right? That are on sort of like, maybe they're not as well-known lakes, right? Like we're not necessarily talking about Lake Joe or, or I think in your case, a lot of your cottages are on like, you know, Lake Ontario or like some sort of like big lake, right? Like a huge well-known lake. So have you any thoughts about how you how you would go about valuing some of these cottages that are on these more nondescript lakes, kind of in the middle of nowhere? Like, how do I know it's actually going to be a good deal? And then 
more importantly, I think, how do I approach the financing for that? Am I going to have to go in all cash? Because like, how do I actually get this thing appraised when like all of the cottages around me are potentially shack like buildings. And I want to come in and add say a hundred thousand dollars, make it really beautiful. I know, I know a bit about your model and hopefully you'll, you'll share a bit tonight about how you renovate, but you know, how do I get that thing appraised? How do I acquire it? And how do I know, you know, whether or not it's, it's going to rent. Right? Yeah. So in terms of, so for first question, in terms of, you know, establishing the value, I mean, I, I'm going to use the same answer that I'll use for other terms of investing, which is rely on your team. You know, can you, can you talk to a realtor in the area that can confirm that value? Talk about ARV. Um, so that would be my answer there. But your second question about financing is where, where I, that's really been my ability to scale in this is we don't buy anything with a bank mortgage. Um, the predominant, most of these cottages that are going to be great deals are either three season lake, lake water source, uh, holding tanks, uh, not insulated, uh, maybe uh, road servicing is an issue uh, that doesn't service in the winter. So what, what can you do to the property to put it in a more financeable form? So uh, turning, adding, adding a heat source to a non-heat source cottage is one of the biggest things you can do. This can be electric baseboard heat. I hear people talking about, you know, HVAC systems, $20,000. You can use a split system. You can use electric baseboard heat. That's one way to add value on a smaller scale. We do, on most of our properties, we're buying, we want to go from 400 to eight, 900. So we're doing HVAC systems, uh, smart thermostat so we can manage, manage it from a distance, lock out temperatures, make sure utilities aren't being burned. Um, and then the next question you asked about, uh, uh, how do I know my cottage is going to rent and how much it's going to be for? Uh, guys, uh, there's a lot of great Facebook groups right now, Ontario Cottages for Rent, uh, Tall Pines Cottages. Uh, you can check out my pricing on my website. I think uh, Rebecca shared that. Um, the cottage market rental is crazy. Uh, have a look around for comparable rents, just like you would with a long-term property. Look for those comparable rents. Uh, I, I'll give you guys a little bit of a, a, a pro tip here that I that I figured out. Shallow, sandy entry. A property that's waterfront with shallow, sandy entry. Parents with kids, grandparents, people who aren't as great swimmers. I, who likes jumping in the weedy the weedy lake? No, I hate it. Nobody. The heat no, it's yeah. worse. Right? So uh, the shallow sandy entry is a really popular thing that a lot of people in these forums who are looking for cottages want. So if you can deliver from that, um, if, you can, if you can stay three hours from the GTA in terms of a commutable distance, that's a real popular um, distance for travel. Um, so those are some of the, the things that I, that I use and some of the, the ways that I evaluate. Absolutely. That, that's fantastic, Kyle. And you mentioned your website and just checking out some of the, the numbers here. So I actually have your website here. And I remember actually being so astonished last time that we were on the webinar. So just to give y'all a background, um, Kyle actually has been on our webinar before. So if you haven't listened to the first episode that Kyle was on, it is amazing. It's actually on Adam's YouTube channel. So make sure you check that out. But one of the things that was astonishing to me is that you actually do a lot of your bookings not through Airbnb but through these Facebook groups that you're talking about through your website and I think that that's so incredible that um, you know you've gone above and beyond to ensure that you're everywhere like you're omnipresent with all of your your rentals so that you can actually keep it consistently rented out so I wanted to actually highlight your website because it looks beautiful and you were just talking about that um kind of sandy area and not having all of the weeds like this is a great beachfront example of that here in Grand Bend and I also do have your Airbnb even though I know that's not um, this is Chelsea um, your your partner here that I pulled up that uh, you have all of your listings all of the prices so you're actually getting like a good chunk of change a night like these are what, 300 bucks a night that's that's like lower off-season pricing in the uh in the prime season, I think we're closer to 700 a night, about 33 to 3,500. So sorry, six, 600 a night. Um, we're, we're quite a bit, we're up there with HST, the cleaning. Um, we're, we're getting pretty good money for these things. 
the the one thing pro COVID, I would say, which you know most things are not pro COVID, but uh, the Canadian travel and tour in, in the industry is going really well. There's there's a good review on this one. <laughs> it's oh, awesome. good. Um, Let's see so, if we can find it. <laughs> it's a bad one. Uh, that, this property that you pulled up here, Rebecca. If, if anyone yeah. saw the video that I did with Matt. This is the property that I secured the million dollar vendor take back on. Nice. I remember this. So I got the million dollar VTB on that one. And we are uh, in October developing this into a four unit luxury beachfront condo. Wow. So the review on it saying that it looks like this place needs to be torn down. Well, it's going to be torn it down. Be. <laughs> you know, like this, this Chill. Is and I want to say, I'm glad you're showing these pictures, Rebecca, because if you look at all my other stuff, this is the only cottage that looks like this. If you, the reason we get away with this is it's premium location. So people yeah. will rent this one. But if you look at some of my other properties, okay. most people don't want the rustic cottage experience. They tell their friends that they want. They want it to be pretty. Mm -hmm. They want it to be designed, air conditioning, dishwashers, stainless steel appliances. They say they want the, the rustic stuff, but these cottages, the pretty ones, rent way more, way faster. Hot tubs. Night. Yep. I was going to say, I see a hot tub here and uh, that's something that you added in last time that we were talking. So how has that performed? Ridiculously. Like they're all paid for already. In instantly booked. Like hot tubs in the winter are a must. I promise you guys, it's a giant pain in the ass. They're, it's such a headache <laughs> to deal with, but the return is there. People want a hot tub. You not only appeal to the party groups, but you also appeal to the couples that just want to get away and, you know, drink wine, cook good food and relax. So um, I'll, you're going to, you're going to hate dealing with them. I promise you that, but the return on a hot tub is 100% there. Yeah. And I look at these locations. really insightful photos because like what this is showing me, the first cottage we looked at is what I imagine when you say the word cottage, these yep. are what I imagine somebody from Toronto, uh, somebody from a, a major urban area, like a dense populated area goes where they actually mean they want their house in a, a more remote remote location, right? So the quality of finishes here look exactly like I, I suspect the people's houses look who can actually afford to pay 700, 800, $1,000 a night. Once we factor in HST cleaning costs uh, and, and any other sort of service fees that Airbnb is actually passing on, or if you're doing it on, from some other platform, typically on a lot of these platforms, the, uh, the platform itself is gonna pass forward a cost to the actual user, right? So for anybody that's not uh, super well read on Airbnb, all of their fees, like they charge you a really small fee as the host, but the guest actually gets a bunch of cost on top of what you're charging for your nightly rate, plus your cleaning fees and your security deposit. So what you gotta imagine here is like, what Kyle's done is you look at these photos. I mean, this is nicer than any house I've ever owned. Okay, and this is what we're calling a cottage. And so really what we're doing here is we're capturing the hearts and minds of the people in the city who can truly afford this type of vacation. And they also have a respect for your property and your, um, and your finishes. And they also ha have a healthy respect for money, right? They actually understand that what they're staying in and what they're consuming as a product is actually a really beautiful thing. And so this is going to target a totally different class of tenant. Okay. Now they're probably called guests in this case, but you know what I mean? The people that are coming to stay here, they appreciate what's going to happen to a security deposit. If something goes crazy, they will probably tidy the place up before they go a little bit, right? They'll probably leave the place in a decent condition and follow your house rules uh, in a way that allows you to feel good about this type of investment when you're sitting at home or when you're sitting in Turks and Caicos, right? Um, so <laughs> yeah, Kyle's not a huge fan of winter. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think it's really good to point this out right now. What, what do you think your actual total cost of these types of renovations would look like? And I know it's, it's gonna depend on the deal, but what sort of range are we looking at? And then how do I get that money back? Is it purely cash flow, or can I eventually expect to see some of this cash back from, yeah. from a bank or some other institution? Yeah, so I talked a lot about acquisition privately. Um, all, yeah. of our, all of our properties now, aside from the, the, the big VTB one, and the, we have two that are under private because they're under construction right now. Um, 
All of them are financed institutionally now. Uh, once we did that value add renovation, which on average, like when you looked at some of the nice ones there, I think we were between 100 and 150, depending on the square footage of the house. So we were putting 100, 150 into the value added renovation. Once we had it all done, we were able to refinance conventionally. Now, it's very important that you, you understand when you're financing cottages conventionally, you, you can't use your Airbnb or short term income. You have to use market rent and market rent in these areas can be not great uh, on an appraisal. So what that means is sometimes you can't get to rate to 80% on the refi, or you have to put a little bit more down payment on a purchase if you're buying turnkey. Um, but where you will absolutely make that up is in cash flow. Uh, these, these properties, um, I, I shared a rule with you guys last time. Uh, one of my rules with cottages is a lot of people think there's eight prime weeks. There's actually 12 prime weeks from about June 15th to September 15th is prime. Um, and I want my cottages to cover all the pity, principal, interest, taxes, insurance, and cleaning costs throughout that period. As long as my cottage covers its pity in that 12 weeks, the other nine months of the year, or nine, not, yeah, approximately nine months of the year, is essentially free cash flow for me. Right. So uh, there's cleaning costs that are passed on to the guests. But uh, since COVID, our cottages until the newest short-term rental ban, which has been about a month now, we're book solid and they are book solid. Again, as soon as, as soon as the ban comes off, we have bookings ready to go. They will be booked out indefinitely until for the rest of the year. So. Yeah. I know that was a big question when uh, people were looking at short-term rentals and stuff like that, when they started, uh, well, just when initially COVID came to light, right? Like last March. And I had Airbnbs and I, I was also like, shit, I wonder what's going to happen. And all of, all of my bookings canceled. It was the craziest thing. They all canceled and Airbnb was like, well, you know what? Uh, we're actually not going to be doing like uh, charging the guests for those cancellations because obviously it's outside of their control. And so the hosts were like, shit, eh? That's going to maybe, that's going to maybe hurt us. But then all of a sudden the craziest thing happened my Airbnbs just went from like 70% occupancy to a hundred overnight. So everything canceled, like every single booking canceled for like everything I had in the future and then bang a hundred percent. And I couldn't keep, I literally was like, Holy shit. So every single week I was raising the prices on my Airbnbs. Cause I couldn't, I just couldn't make sense of how we could have that type of occupancy. And so we've started to see a whole new class of guests or a whole new, uh, demographic of guests who is going to be converting their international travel um, into domestic travel. And then there's also those people that may need to work uh, if you're more of in an urban center uh, who may need to just go there for work or visiting family or for any other reason where they do want to stay relatively isolated, but also need the ability to travel and be in a city where they don't actually own a property. Right. And I don't know if right now is the time where you want to be hanging out at the holiday inn right it's a pretty shitty experience your mask on mask off mask on mask off you're basically a terrorist every time you walk in the building and then you're in a fucking elevator with people it's it's horrible you're right back into the problem that you were in before so this is why it's actually so convenient for so many people now to want to go to airbnbs in general or short-term rentals in general because uh, they can cook for themselves there they can do all these things now we add in the element of domestic travel, right? Where you can actually bring your family over to a place like this. I'm loving it. Uh, but there's some questions that we still need to have answered here in terms of cottage Airbnb 101. So, you know, generally speaking, I find a property, I look around, if there's any nice properties around, I can generally look at those as my ARVs or comparables. I'm probably gonna have to though bring my own equity or some sort of private capital to acquire the building and then renovate it. And we've seen you, you've renovated fairly extensively. I would say that that's easy, a hundred grand in any of those buildings. Yep. And then how do I now, like, where am I going to look? So all of a sudden I've got a, I've got a beautiful building. I've got uh, a, a big expense every month because I've raised private money or, or I've dumped all of my capital. Who am I going to get now to run this thing? Where do I advertise it? Who's going to actually do the day-to-day -day operations? How do I find these people? Or is so, it going to be me? Well, so several things here so first of all 
I don't use Airbnb. I 100% still use Airbnb, and Airbnb is still uh, one of our main uh, calendar resources that we're using. We're just promoting on other sites as well. So, yeah. uh, for example, uh, Chelsea's sister, she, she's in this business as well. She predominantly just runs her Airbnb. She's got one cottage. It's booked pretty pretty good, but we, we really aggressively fill those gaps on ours. That's how we're scaling. So you can just do Airbnb, keep it pretty simple. If you're looking to scale and, and buy more, you're going to want to be on multiple sources. In terms of finding, uh, finding resources, um, the, uh, it, it's a funny thing for finding construction people. One of the best things we ever do, the first thing we do is we find the bin guy in the area. Whoever yeah. does the demo bin, that's who we're going to for all the construction contacts because they have them all. That's huge. Uh, build a relationship with that guy. Uh, Kijiji, uh, Facebook Marketplace for a cleaner. Find your cleaner. Pay them more. That Do not hire the cheapest cleaner. Yeah. Do not hire somebody who's looking to maybe start cleaning houses. Hire mm -hmm. a cleaner or a cleaning company um, we like, for the most part, we like a, a, a really devoted cleaner, not a company, uh, that we can have a more personal relationship, and they tend to treat the cottage like their own. Yeah. Like, if, if a guest isn't checked out when they get there and they think it's a problem, you know, these, these cleaners are going kung fu on, on yeah. the, like, get out of here, this, like, like the, we really empower your cleaner because they're going to save you a ton of headache. They, they're buying materials for us now, like, if we run out of toilet paper, paper towel. They go buy that stuff when they do their groceries for us. So dish soap, everything like that. So our cleaner really takes care of a lot of that. One of the best things that ever happened to me in all of my property management property endeavors was the first cottage I ever bought in Wyerton. I live in Kitchener, so it was about two and a half hours away from my house. When there was a plumbing issue in Kitchener at a triplex, I went to the property and called the plumber. <laughs> sat there stood there watched the plumber the plumber fixed it and then the plumber emailed me the bill what was i doing there nothing it was a complete waste of time when i bought my first cottage in wyerton it changed my entire business because i learned that i can't drive to watch the plumber yeah that's so crazy i'm gonna call the plumber i googled look for reviews found the best plumber talked to my bin guy he recommended the one guy we then we uh, uh sorry Talk to the bin guy, recommend the plumber, call the plumber. The plumber went and you know what? It was probably a little bit more expensive than I normally paid for a plumber. There's probably an extra 30, 40 bucks on there, but it didn't cost me any time. Yeah. It was the most important thing. The return on my time was a hundred percent. I got a phone, I got a phone call, called it in, done. We now have, uh, we have a full-time vacation manager that works as an employee for us. So um, Chelsea still does the sales. Uh, Monique runs the day-to-day -day communication and then we have a full-time maintenance person that works for us as well so we get a call now uh, or, or we get an email through our, 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 our company Monique dispatches Chris Chris goes fixes we're good that's awesome yeah I, I totally agree and believe in that uh, cleaner idea like I, I firmly believe that that may be and feel free to argue me on this, but I think that's probably the most important part of the entire business for this yes. strategy. Um, yeah. I know that when I found a great cleaner, it made a night and day, like a zero to one difference. If, you, if there's any uh, Teal fans out there, like literally zero to one difference because she was able to do everything that I didn't want to do. Like literally she cleaned it, she staged it, right? The towels are all rolled up and, and neatly arranged and stuff like that. There's now all of a sudden granola bars and sweeteners and raw sugar and yellow and white sugar and shit I would never think about. Um, uh, the, the whitener stuff that's in there, she would bring in all sorts of cool little things. This stuff's adding like, you know, $30 a month or less to my whole budget, but the experience is brilliant the way it was set up and laid out. You, you open the door to this beautiful basket, it's incredible. And she's there. And she is, again, watching it like it was her own space. If something was out of line, something was out of order, something was broken, something was going to add more time to her day because a guest did something or another, or just repairs and maintenance in general was, general was there, she was on top of it immediately and making sure to let me know. And then she got even tra trained really well by me just saying, yep, that sounds like something you, know, you would do a great job at fixing. And then all of a sudden I stopped getting the calls. She just adds an hour to the invoice. 
goes, picks up. Uh, so this is a creepy thing about uh, short-term rentals. Sometimes they break the bed, okay? I don't know how that could happen, uh, but sometimes they'll break the bed, right? Or there will be stains on, uh, on sheets or toiletries and stuff. Like it, st stuff can go a little bit crazy here, but not to worry because you've got people for this. And I just said, hey, that sounds like a crazy problem. And would you be able to deal with that for me? And she goes, yeah, sure. Can I just charge you my, my hourly rate? And I said, absolutely, I'd love to. Uh, in fact, you know, I was willing to probably pay double because she would now be using her own fuel, her own transportation costs, her own, et cetera. Uh, and then all of a sudden she's got a new uh, bed there. She's freaking assembled the thing. She gets to pocket a couple hundred extra bucks. Uh, and then you, you do all those other good things to, to take care of them, right? Uh, whenever I see her, I bring her a nice bottle of Pinot, right? Whenever I see her, bring her, here's a gift card or whatever for this or that. Like, just take care of these people and they will honestly treat you so well. Because the reality is most other people aren't that great to them, right? I mean, they're paying them not a whole lot of money. Like I paid mine and I'd love to hear your average cost here, Kyle, but we were paying our cleaner $25 an hour and she was literally irreplaceable. Okay. So uh, I absolutely loved that for 25 an hour. I would have happily paid her more for all the management she was doing as well. Um, but she, all she wanted was, you know, please pay me on time. And she wanted to do things somewhat in her way. So all I told her is, hey, as long as the thing's clean by the next booking, I don't care. You can come at midnight and do it. You can come at 6 a.m. You can come whenever you want. Right. And that freedom worked really well because she had another job as well. So I said, OK, as long as you're passionate about it and I keep getting five stars on cleanliness, uh, we're good to go. And so that was her mission. Five stars on cleanliness. That was the only thing that mattered and have it ready. And so, yeah, we treated her really well. Um, one question I had there is you were talking about contractors and stuff. And when you're going right to the bin company, you're just essentially asking for a Rolodex of their um people is there any other tips like that that you could maybe suggest for us for when we're just getting started we maybe don't have the cleaner we don't have the contractors we don't even really know how or where to list it like what are some other cool resources like that that we could leverage to to just get started neighbors get, get up there knock on a door hey i'm gonna be the new owner love to meet you love to get to know you anyone you recommend cottage country people like to talk uh <laughs> You know, you start knocking on doors in downtown Toronto, maybe they're not as keen to just get to know you and talk. And that might be a generalization, but I, I do find in up there when I go to the cottage at the cottages, talk to the neighbors, they'll generally be pretty helpful and give you connections. It's more of a small town feel. So they probably have a nephew or a niece or a brother or sister, somebody who do, does something that you could talk to. So neighbors are a good one. Uh, same thing at the hardware store going into the local home hardware. They're not big box Home Depot or, or Lowe's. These home hardwares are individually owned. So talking to the owners, the cashiers, the paint guy, the, the guy at the lumber yard, whatever it is, talk to these people and ask for referrals. Ask yeah. for, ask who's doing what, right. what, where you can get some help. That's awesome. We've got some questions here that I think are great. One of the questions, uh, and again, for anybody that didn't attend the, the other webinar, Kyle was very adamant that like, the hot tub, he mentioned it again this time, but seriously, he's adamant about this. You need the hot tub. Okay, just have the hot tub, whatever it costs, get it. Uh, but one of the follow-up questions here is, how do, you, how do you have that cleaned? I would assume you just have a local service person. We train our cleaners. Wow, the cleaners are maintaining it as so well. We have a, a full-time maintenance guy that we've just hired. Yeah. He's going to be taking over, because with especially with the new cottage suites, the cottage condo, the motel. Um, right. We need a full-time person there. So yeah, he's going to be taking over. Um, the, the, the Wyerton one, my dad actually drove up every Friday and did it. He is retired. He liked that. So he was doing that one for years. Uh, but we train our cleaners to do it. Uh, and then we, uh, we train our cleaners to do it. And we pay them an extra. We're, we're paying about $150 a clean right now, which if you factor that as an hourly rate, is closer to $40 an hour. Yeah. Um, but And it's a flat rate. Going back to the quality of guests that we have in these places, half the time these cottages are spotless when the cleaners get there. So, but that's where we, over time, we stay on top of the cleaners. If the cottage is clean, you know, get under the beds, get on the baseboards and the curtains, the fans, do a little bit deeper of a clean. Some, uh, the barbecue needs to be clean. Yeah. So if the cottage is spotless, maybe you're on the barbecue that week. But we train our cleaners 
to shock it and just do the basic thing. Yeah. Uh, so we don't need to pay the maintenance people to come. Now the maintenance people are going to be taking over and the cleaners are still going to, when needed, be trained to do it. So some cleaners are worried about liability. Most of them really aren't. Um, they don't mind putting a couple chemicals in. So that's awesome. No, I, I love that answer too. And like, honestly, the, the real way around a lot of this stuff is go ahead and do it yourself the first time, right? But then document the process, right? As soon as you've got the process documented the way that you would like to see it done. Okay. So if that's a certain blend of, uh, of the chlorine and uh, Jesus, I can't even remember. I had to put this forever in our hot tub, but I can't remember what it's called now, but there's another one. It's a quick powder. You just throw it in there. Uh, mm -hmm. But like, if, if that's the basic thing that you do every time, just write this stuff down, right? You, you create over time. And the best way to do this is the first time you do something, if it is the first time you're doing it, write down how you did it, what materials were required, what tools, if any, um, and then how many supplies it actually took. And then that's how you're going to establish the beginning of your standard operating procedures, right? Now, when you can hand off those standard operating procedures, geez, anybody can run these things. Right? It's the same with our, our wholesaling business. I can leave. Right, This is a big deal that everyone needs to really understand is you need to get things documented and systematized to the point where you can just leave your business for any amount of time. No, you might not be able to leave for a year, but you know, if for, in my case, I go moose hunting every year. Okay, That's like a 10-day burden. Now, there's a lot of business owners out there that would just blow their heads out if they tried to imagine leaving and going to an area with no service for 10 days, okay? Um, last year when I did this, utter failure, complete disaster. Things didn't happen. Money was not made. In fact, it probably cost us a lot of money for me to go. This year, however, because we had spent the time to document, systematize, and, and create standard operating procedures, I went away. And, and all I did is I spent probably one or two hours during that entire week on the phone with Rebecca just to check in. Hey, what's the uh, state of the union? Is there anything that I need to help you with to empower you to follow the existing process so that you can operate and do the job that you need to do? Boom. That was it. Two hours. I can do that. No problem. And all of a sudden that work's done. Uh, and our company actually made six figures while I was away. It was like, wow. Oh, my God. They're paying me too much to be there now. Right. So it's it's amazing what you can do when you actually document, systematize these things. So while I think it's, it's great Kyle's trained as people, I think it's also great to go and just do it one time. Right. Or two times. Right. And figure out what you would actually do and, and the quality that you'd like it done. OK, I think that was a big thing with me and my cleaners. The first cleaners I had, I went and I just did like a blind uh like a mystery shopper situation. I just went in and, and went in before the guests were there. And I was like, oh, we're missing a couple points here. So all I did was I just walked through their cleaning, inspected their work with no warning, right? Because people will change their behavior when they, they know you're watching them. It's called the Hawthorne effect. Um, but I, I went in, blind test, walked through it. You know, there's a couple little details, nothing major, but things that I would like done if I was a guest. Hey, and I just, boom, that's a quick text. Hey, Sue, really appreciate the work that you guys did. I think you did a fantastic job. If you could just fix these few more points, I just had to run into the building and I noticed these couple of details. I would love it if that's something we could have prepared for our guests so that I can continue getting five-star reviews, which will allow me to get more guests in the future, which will allow me to empower you to build a bigger, better business and potentially even hire more people so that you don't need to be the one cleaning. How about that? Right now, they're all of a sudden like, yeah, I should try and get more five-star reviews. And then maybe he'll buy more Airbnbs or refer me out. All of a sudden, I can step away and get an employee under me. And that's exactly what ended up happening with that lady's business. Now, I ended up pivoting to another cleaning company because she was fantastic. But I, I could see the whole multi-step process here in just empowering them and double checking on the work and making sure it was up to that standard. So I love that. Um, next question here is... Um, how does it cash flow if you buy it for $1 million? So are you buying cottages that are at the $1 million mark? Or are you buying cottages that are potentially in disrepair and in need of strategic renovations that would bring it up potentially even to that type of valuation? So out of, out of the nine cottages that I own right now, the purchase price was between three and six, six, sorry, out of the eight cottages, eight cottages that I own, Three, the purchase price was between 300 and 665. 
Okay. We are doing value added on all those. ARVs on a couple of them are closer to a million now, um, but the purchase prices were lower. The ninth, the ninth cottage, the million dollar VTB, I actually purchased that for one point one five. This isn't a this isn't a one hundred one part of the program. I had a two year burn rate factored into that. I'm doing right. a development that requires two million dollars in additional capital. That is that's not in the the cash flow cottage model. But on average, Rebecca and I were talking about this on email the other day on well, that one deal you were ta- we were talking about, and the purchase price was just a little bit too high for me. I was in the more five hundred to a million dollar range is where I want to be now for purchase price. But here's what I'll tell you: there's uh, I have a friend of mine. He's a former pro hockey player. His family has multi million dollar cottages in Muskoka. They're renting these cottages for fifteen twenty thousand a week. Yeah, they're yeah. so. I haven't ran the cash flow numbers on that, but 20k a week times 12 is 240. Off season, call it another 120, 360, one uh, percent rule. I mean, that's 3.3.6 million, right? Yeah. So, can you cash flow them? Yeah, y- yeah, yeah. You can. Uh, you just maybe maybe have a different clientele, a little more, and need to pay for higher servicing for that clientele. Nice. One of the next questions here, which I think butts up pretty good. It's it's a little adjacent, but. Um, you know, how do the neighbors feel when you're actually approaching these buildings and, and starting to commence renovations and then planning for a short-term rental? Uh, I think this has a lot to do with the type of clientele you're, you're going to have, but I'll let you speak to that. You can't make everybody happy. Um, yeah. We, uh, for the most part, our, our neighbors are all great. Uh, they know what we do, but, but more importantly, they know that we really take care of our properties. Yeah. We have landscaping people there every week. We have cleaners. We have maintenance people. So yes, we have people coming and going from the properties, but we're also well-maintained, well taken care of, professional management taking care of them. With that being said, um, I do have a, a neighbor at a specific, specific property that does not like what we do. And is there is issues with that neighbor. Um, you know, what we do is we do, we do our best to respect the rules. Uh, when there's a short-term rental ban, we don't operate. Uh, we try to keep, you know, we tell our guests 11 o'clock, if you're late after 11 at that cottage, you're going to get called on. So yeah. shut your party down at 11. If you're planning on partying, don't book this cottage. It's not for you. And most people appreciate that. And then there's lots of people who say, I love the sounds of that. You know, my family's in bed by 930 every night. That's great. We're up early. We want to be at that cottage. So don't, you, you, there, there, I call them NIMBYs, not in my backyard. It's a development term. Um, but th- they are out there. Do your best. Stick to the rules. Communicate with them. Take care of your property. They're not going to love what you're doing. Um, but, you know, do, do your best to be a good property owner and a good person um, in dealing with those situations. And uh, I got one, one specific property that's a problem. It is what it is. We stay within the rules. They know it. We know it. We're not going to go out for dinner anytime soon, uh, but it is what it is. Now, everybody's now waiting for a horror story. So tell us, like, what's your worst horror story? Mostly mostly just messes. Like, yeah. one group, they took all the mattresses outside to lay this one on them. <laughs> uh, that, that specific cottage, uh, you know, I know it was frustrating for people from the GTA that were coming up there, but you could only leave one bag of garbage. Right. It, it, it was a rural property. There's animals. You could only leave one bag. Well, they didn't think that was right. And we, it, there is fully disclosed up front. So they left four bags of garbage outside overnight. Animals tore it apart. It was a mess on the lawn. The cleaner had to clean it up. <coughs> Excuse me. I sure got some water. Um, uh, you know, I, condoms are, we've, we found some condoms. <laughs> On the end table, that's pretty gross. Our cleaners weren't happy about it. Uh, we've yeah. had some. I'll segue that into the broken bed conversation. Yeah, uh, uh, we've had quite a few broken beds. Um, honestly, most people, we you know, we take a five hundred dollar damage deposit. They break the bed. It costs us two hundred dollars to replace the bed. A hundred dollars for a maintenance guy to fix it. We give them back two hundred bucks out of their deposit. We say you broke the bed. They maybe complain a little bit, but they know they broke the bed. Yeah, they complain about it a little bit, but they know they did it. So we do have some, uh, you know, some of our guests have called them passive aggressive, but it, it is what it is. 
we have some outrageous fees for things. It's in, in at that one cottage now. We're allowed. We allow up to three bags of garbage. We've got a better system. We allow up to three bags of garbage. If you leave any more garbage, it's two hundred dollars a bag. It's not to be crazy, but we have to pay a cleaner to dispose of it. There's uh, they have to drive somewhere. We have to deal deal with the administration of paying them for it. So yeah. it's a deterrent um, that we use for that. There's also yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think what else we have. If you you know spill on the furniture. For example, if you wreck the furniture, we're probably going to charge you your full five hundred dollars. A cleaning the couch might not be sufficient. We might need to replace this couch. So we we would recommend don't eat on the furniture. Uh, at the end of the day, we work with people. We're not in the business of taking deposits. It's a pain in the ass for a week to to fight back with a person. We just want to cover our cost. If you broke something, broke the chair, it's forty bucks, fifty dollar admin fee for us to deal with buying a new chair. Here's your money back. Thank you. Have a great day. Yeah, absolutely. I always charged my full security deposit, regardless of what my hard cost was when I had things like that happen. But I think my worst case was, um, you know, a case of like some decent blood or red wine or something like that on the white carpet. And you know what? The cleaners show up and they just give you a call. Hey, we're going to need an extra, you know, a little bit of time today. Can we possibly push back the check in one or two hours? And then uh, they went right to work with a steam cleaner. So they rented a steam cleaner, got the steam cleaner there, did, did the whole job. Now, what I did to mitigate this, and this is why you collect that security deposit, is I just said, hey, guys, so sorry about this, but our check-in is going to be a little bit delayed today. Uh, we had a late checkout that we couldn't control. We're working on getting it resolved. Where can I send you guys for lunch? Right. And so that was it. And then half the people are just like, you know what, we're late heading out anyways. Don't worry about it. But thank you so much for the consideration. Right. And then that's all you got to do. You just where can I send you for lunch or, or a drink or whatever. And they're more than happy to wait a little bit of time uh, unless they got big deal things going on. And then usually when they have a big deal thing where they just, hey, we got to drop off our stuff because the car is full and we need to pick somebody up. Hey, no problem. Here's the code to the garage. Please feel free to drop your stuff in there for now or in the mudroom. And uh, the house will be available for you to check in uh, at, at this time, right? And then you set a, a very clear expectation as to when they can check in. A uh, couple questions here. I'll answer super quick because they're just uh, easier ones. Whatever happens uh, if the people break the rules, typically you're going to find uh, a, the neighbor might call you if you've got good relationship with them. Uh, you'll find out after the fact from your cleaners. And that's when you're collecting these security deposits. If the neighbor is having issues at the time being, easiest solution is usually um, gonna, well, they're probably just gonna do it. It's just a noise complaint. Now, the unfortunate thing with that is if you get a lot of those, you're going to end up with issues with your city. So what I do is proactively go to the neighbors. Hey guys, uh, you know, I appreciate your understanding of this. This is how I make my living. So if you could, if ever there's an issue, please give me a ring, right? Or give that number to somebody else on your team that's gonna be the manager. Please give us a ring. I'll do my very best to resolve it before it ever needs to get to a city matter. By the way, here's a bottle of Pinot, right? Every single time you ever go and talk to anybody, bring them a bottle of wine, bring them some kind of gift, a uh, case of beer. You know, I know that sometimes you're going to be pissed off about the people driving on the street and whatever. Not a problem. Here's a case of beer. Just give me a ring if there's ever an issue, right? Every single time gift giving is huge. People will think, you know what? Not a bad guy. I'm going to actually give him a call and give him the benefit of the doubt before I, I run into a problem. Um, negative reviews before the, uh, or sorry, do you get negative reviews because of stricter rules? Generally, no, because you will, you will have had to agree to those rules in order to book the place. Now, if somebody leaves you a negative review because of that, now that's something we can actually communicate with your platform that you're using. So if it's Airbnb, hey guys, uh, this is very well spelled out in the, in the um, house rules as well as the listing. So please uh, put this into consideration. Airbnb will probably help you out on that. If it's a private um, listing or booking or through your website or some sort of Facebook thing, again, I think that's where you just err on the side of professionalism. Hey, appreciate your, your feedback. The house rules are listed very clearly in the, uh, in the listing. And we're sorry that you didn't have an opportunity to read those before you got here, right? Like being super professional, don't ever lose your shit publicly. Um, these guys, 
behind closed doors, obviously they're morons, but like you, that's not going to help you get your next booking. So just move forward professionally. Uh, gifts or write off says Sean, great point there. Yeah. Every one of these expenses now related to your Airbnb is going to generally be an operating expense, right? So your cleaning supplies, all those, the cleaner themselves, right? These are all operational expenses that you're going to be able to use uh, against your income, which you're going to want because you're going to get a lot of income if you do it right. Um, so I wouldn't, again, this is another one of those things. Don't be too concerned about what the cleaner charges. If they're the best, amazing. That's a direct expense, right? So if they're charging you 40 instead of 25, cool. As long as I get a five star every single time, I'm more than happy to have that write off. Um, next question. How do you get the bed replaced before the next guest arrives? Um, uh, I'll share my bed story. Kyle can share his or best practices here. Standardization is your best friend. Okay. So here's the thing with all real estate investing. Don't ever try and be cute. I, I've noticed actually that Kyle's um, listings are actually a little bit different. So this is more of a unique space with the cottages, but it doesn't have to be. Okay. One of the best hacks in all of real estate, like a, a life hack here, just standardize everything. The same beds, the same tile on the floor, the same finishes, the same uh, linens, the same consumables. That way, if you ever do run into an issue, you can very easily have one on hand. Okay, if you have one on hand and your cleaner has access to that thing, right? One extra Keurig, right? You don't want, if there's no coffee, you will die. Okay, they will punish you to death. Okay, if there's no internet, you are also going to die. All right, if there's no, uh, in this case, hot tub, if that thing's broken, you're going to die. Okay, so have an extra motor, have an extra jet, have whatever that thing is going to break, have it, right? Have the extra, um, a bed, like a bed's not expensive. The only pain in the ass is the amount of time that it takes to actually set the thing up. So that's where, again, your cleaner should be timing these and you should be setting the rules as the, as the host to give them a lot of time. Okay. So generally speaking, I think my checkouts were like 10 or 11 AM. And then the, the check-in was not till four. Okay. So that's actually a lot of time. If you got to assemble a bed, okay, uh, no problem. Is there any one of your friends you could hire for the day at your rate? You pay them whatever you want, but I'll pay you your rate to hire somebody else to help you. And that way we can get this thing cranked out in time. Cool. Maybe they pay them 10, 15 bucks an hour and they pocket the other 25. I'm more than happy to do that. Let's get this bed set up and operating for 4 p.m. Bang. That's it. So, you know, problems or profits is really the answer on my end. Kyle, I don't know if you have any hacks to add as well for like, you know, when things are going wrong or something's broken a couple things first of all i want to answer the do you get negative reviews because of the stricter rules uh we get people who like to who comment before they book about not liking those rules our cottages are no longer suitable for their booking if they don't like those rules then they're the exact people to me it's the tim hortons coffee cup rule why does the tim hortons coffee cup said say that the coffee's hot the coffee better be hot we have paid for hot coffee the fact is, if somebody spilled the coffee and sued them. So the same reason why we have all of these strict, crazy rules is because people fail to follow the rules. The reason why we have absurd fees is because people, if it's not absurd, won't follow the rules. So yes, we've gotten a couple notes saying we thought the, the rules were a little bit strict. And that's because those people were good people that wouldn't do anything anyways. So they thought we were a little over the top. When we explain to them that, listen, these things are happening frequently, that's why it's there. They normally are like, oh yeah, you know, we understand. Not everybody gets it. So about that one, um, I want to say a, a very important thing about the hot tub too, um, because stocking parts for hot tubs and, and guaranteeing hot tubs is very difficult. Um, the hot tubs are not included in our rental rate. They are a bonus feature in all of our contracts which means if for whatever reason, the hot tub isn't working when you're there, there's no refund for that. We do our best to maintain our hot tubs and 99% of the time they are working. Every once in a while, the cottage guest before screws it up and we do our best to get somebody there quickly, normally 24, 48 hours, but it's a bonus feature in the booking. So that's one thing that we had to do to protect ourselves. Uh, in terms of the bed, yes, we have some cool design, uh, Chelsea's a, a amazing at decor and paint colors to change it. But if you start looking at a lot of those recent renovations, all the features are the same. 
standard yeah same flooring same tiles when possible um we do we do some creative stylistic things but we uh we have a garage up in grand bend where most most of our stuff is we have an extra mattress in there we usually have a couple metal bed frames so yeah. not our nicer ones just the ugly metal ones um and there's a couple times where we've had to move that in for a booking or we talked to the guest and said hey listen the bed broke before you were there we normally say the kids were jumping on it to keep it clean um the kids were jumping on it before you there broke the bed um so our, i know it's a little bit inconvenient but the mattress is on the floor and for the most part as long as we're getting a bed in there at some point over their stay and we're we're turning it around quickly most people are pretty reasonable with us um yeah. they, they, they'll, they'll work with you just the number one thing that i can tell you is if you if there's something wrong before the person gets there tell them before they get there and it'll go so much better oh, yeah. they find it and you didn't tell them they there it, it just changes the dynamic if you're up front the keurig broke guys i i'm doing my best here's go go to tim hortons tomorrow send me the bill i got it for you tomorrow the keurig's going to be there tomorrow i promise adam is right the wi-fi thing is you're going to kill it like you have to have wi-fi have the have the service number there so they can call in and most of the time that the, you have to validate for them as well um but if it's just a reset thing they can get it done so um yeah uh, that, i hope that helps absolutely man every time you're on call there's just so many golden nuggets here i absolutely love it we had one question here in the chat that uh was asking about how you actually find these deals so i'm just going to touch on that briefly here we actually are in this space as a, a wholesaling team so we do have off-market uh wholesale vacation cottage deals. And this is actually how you can find them. So if you're not already opted into our cottage buyers list, ensure that you do that. So it's www.cottagebuyers.com slash private deals. This is what the website looks like. All you do is just enter in your information here and then you'll be opted into our list. So uh, as Adam mentioned at the beginning here, we actually just recently assigned our first uh, cottage deal and there is plenty more to come. So make sure that you hop onto that list. If you're looking for these cottage properties, we'll have the, the agreement to purchase and sale already negotiated for you. So all the hard work is done and you just get to perform like Kyle has done with all of his Airbnbs. And one other piece here too is for just regular um, houses we also have our off market deals list which if you're not on here is the link as well um so absolutely fantastic spot to go for any deals and a couple of announcements here before we wrap up and and have our last few words so um we're actually growing as a team so we're really looking to expand into some of these new markets and we're absolutely looking to bring on some new team members we actually just hired a new team member uh very recently natalie she's fantastic she's uh, our new admin and we're looking for more wholesalers as well uh as uh multiple positions on the team to fill so um another just quick thing here is that we have our problems or profits merch it's at uh, teespring.com slash stores slash Matt McKeever merch. So make sure that you check that out if you don't already have some problems or profits swag. And this is also another spot that you can find our deals. So this is our uh, very own Facebook page. It's Ontario Private Deals. We're very quickly growing this, this Facebook page. We've already got over, uh, I think it's now at 2.6 thousand members. So we're really expanding that and, and inviting any wholesalers, any um, investors to come onto that page, post their deals and, and also just connect about um, off market properties, whether it be cottage or otherwise. And now to the private deals. So before I get into that, Adam and, and Kyle, did you have any, any last uh, questions that you wanted to, to bring up or any last points on the, the vacation Airbnb cottage deals? Um, Dave in the chat actually just mentioned a service called AirDNA. And AirDNA is actually a really good tool if you're starting at like zero and you're like trying to figure out, you know, what's actually going on in your market. Are there any Airbnbs to begin with? Are there any, um, 
you know, what's the average price? What's the vacancy or occupancy? Uh, what are the different styles? So AirDNA is actually a really extensive platform when you get into it. The pricing model is kind of scary sometimes because depending on where you're at, it can be very expensive, but it, it's priced kind of per region. But if you just pay for your region, you can pay only for like one or two months and just start looking at the data. And really inside there, you can actually see the list, like the real listing view of the best listings in the market. You can also see the average um, nightly prices. You can see the cleaning fees. You can see, um, you know, the, the bedroom and bathroom mix of a lot of the competitors that you'll have in your market. So really cool tool that aggregates a lot of data by pulling information from Airbnb's website uh, somehow on the back end. No idea how it works, but it's actually a really cool resource that I did use uh, when I was setting up my three Airbnbs in London, actually, when I was first starting. So uh, to Dave's point, not sure if the data is always going to be bang on. I actually found that I was usually able to exceed whatever the averages were there. So I found myself in probably the top one or two percent of what the data was saying you might be in. So just take that into, into um, consideration is like, if you do have a great cleaner, if you do have a really visually appealing space that has all the uh, utility that a guest might want and all the amenities that they might want, you're probably going to be at the top end of whatever they're suggesting. So uh, that's what I found. So great resource for anybody looking at it. Um, Facebook group name, Rebecca, what is that thing called? Ontario, Ontario Private Deals. Deals. And then uh, Kyle, I guess Bobby here just has one last question. How, how did you actually find your deals, like your real deals that you've purchased? Uh, I'm half on market, half off market. So, um, I do, you know, in, in Grand Bend, I do work with a, a realtor up there uh, that has found me some great deals. But since then, it's been more the getting to know my neighbors, getting to know the, the contractors, getting to know the other cottage owners, one thing that some of the other cottage owners have seen is that we're getting a lot more in rent than they are. And they don't understand why. Yeah. Well, have a look at the property. This is why. So, but in terms of finding the deals, uh, I think working with people like Adam and Rebecca is a great call because we need the like, off market is where the best opportunities are going to come and buying unfinanceable cottages with private money is the number one thing that I do to get better deals. Yeah. Uh, a lot of cottage buyers are looking for turnkey financeable stuff so bob and mary can put the heloc on the house at home and buy the cottage with the with the, the big green bank or the big blue bank but those properties are selling for a lot of money right now and very aggressively on market if you're looking to make a lot of money in this business you need to buy off market uh you know working with people like rebecca adam door knocking in the area finding the deals you want to do and buy properties that that bob and mary homeowner can't finance because that's where the real opportunity has been for me and, and my, my growth in this, this space. Yeah. I think the, everybody wants the easy answer. Like these things just pop up on market or something, but the reality is there's so much competition there. Like you guys can take one look right now in your markets, just any, any property on realtor.ca is going to be getting multiple offers and it's, there's a ton of competition out there. Um, we actually send out, tens or hundreds, depending on where we're at, but hundreds of thousands of handwritten letters go out um, on behalf of our company to actually market for these private opportunities. And that's often how we're able to get so many leads. So I guess why my company exists is a lot of people don't have the time or energy or, or quite frankly, the capital um, to market the way that I can in order to get the number of leads necessary to identify great deals. Okay, that's the reality of it. That's my whole business model is I just outspend everybody. And that allows me to get in front of way more people, which allows me to make significantly more negotiations. So for example, we've had fit over 1500 calls since the start of the year. Okay, that's a that's a that's many full time jobs. Okay, because each call turns well, each qualified call turns into a walkthrough, which turns into an offer, which turns into a negotiation, which turns into um, actually having properties locked up and having to require deposits and stuff like that. So if you want to do deals, like we've done over 60 deals in the last 13 months, the only way to do that is with significant lead generation. So 
that's kind of what Rebecca and I are doing. And that's what we bring to the table. It is just really, we we're well practiced, right? I've written over a thousand offers on private real estate transactions in the last 13 months. So I've literally written more contracts than most realtors will, uh, certainly in that time frame, probably more than any realtor. So um, like that provides us access to more deals. And that's what we're sharing with you guys with, uh, with things like cottagebuyers.com and, and mattmcuber.com slash private deals. So um, with that all being said, Rebecca, show us some deals. Kyle, thank you so much for uh, coming on today. I really do appreciate your insights and I'm learning stuff. Right. This this is fantastic. That's why we do these webinars. Um, we really do believe at our company in having impact. And one of the uh, things about impact is just constantly improving. And so that's why these problems or profits webinars for me are so key because I get to come on here, share a bit of my thoughts and inspire, hopefully, some of the new people that we haven't met before, but also learn with you. So thanks, Kyle. Uh, definitely appreciate your time and information before you guys all jump off of here and run away and get back to whatever you do. Uh, stick around here for some off-market deals that we do have. They're not cottages, but they are private deals. So what more can I do for you? <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So I'm going to go through all of them. I'm going to go through five right now. So uh, this is 40 Gray Street in Chatham. We actually had almost a, a twin building, 34 Gray Street, that's already assigned. So this particular property, uh, the the cover photo here reminds me of the Adams family. And that's probably a good depiction of the neighborhood grade here. So we've got uh, a, a pretty low grade neighborhood in terms of expectations. It, it needs a lot of work and it's gonna be a full gut job, but it is a great burr opportunity. Actually, I'm just gonna scroll down here to the comparable sales. So it's actually an investor in our network who owns this 81 Lorne. And uh, they were telling me the other day that they actually cash flow on this property, I think it's $1,700 or something like that on one property. And that's 300 meters away here. So in terms of like, opportunity and upside there's really a lot of room here so that's a, a burr a fourplex in chatham uh really really fantastic um opportunity to add value to this building um and i will emphasize that value add because uh definitely there's a lot of room for improvement. Now, when I've sent this one out, we actually are experimenting with something called Matterport. So make sure you actually go through the Matterport. Let me just see if I can pull up one of the units now. It's this super cool feature where uh, we actually I'm use it on- ready for that. <laughs> not ready for that. I'll, I'll show a nice one. I'll let you guys check out the worst unit yourselves. <laughs> so um, this is basically what you can do with these matter ports. Is it's a nice little 3D image and we can actually walk through um, the, the property as if it's like a virtual little walkthrough. So as you can see, again, this, this property definitely needs some work. So this is the kitchen. It's nice and outdated. Um, but these are, are the types of things that we're really trying to move forward with on our team so that you have a little bit more of a comprehensive overview. Because um, what we were finding at the beginning of the year is we had several properties that just went really quickly sight unseen. So we just wanted to ensure that you actually got a little bit of a better view of what the inside looks like. So this is 40 Gray Street. Make sure you check that out. Following this webinar, I, I'm going to send out another full um, list with all of the links. So this is what the email looks like. It has the description of the property. It has the buyer's package that I'm showing you today, as well as links to photos and videos. And for this building in particular, the Matterport. So next one that I'm going to show you here is Glencoe Drive, uh, or in Glencoe, uh, it's Concession Drive. So this is our single family, another great opportunity for a burr. So what we're looking at here is uh, the, the property, we actually have a ton of renovations already done. And uh, the ARV here is around 340. So we actually had a full assessment of the property done. And, and if you're really interested in this one, we actually have a walk through this property tomorrow. And and uh, I can actually send you that um, appraisal report because it was actually appraised 
uh, with renovations unfinished at 310 already. Um, and that was like a few months ago now. So if you're looking for a, a property that definitely has a lot of upside, this is one of them. And it is already rented. The tenant, uh, I believe the, the lease is up like December, 2021. So um, they're actually pay paying market rents and, and you'd be able to come into this, this situation um, with cash flow. So um, just a few renovations to finish here on this particular property. It's 265, that's in Glencoe. Um, again, we have all of the building specs here. You can see they've, they've started doing the siding. The material is actually there to finish this little bit of siding at the back, but the renovations are actually quite nice. Um, if you look at some of these pictures, so like this property um, really has a, a nice little island here, um, beautiful renovations going on. So definitely check that out. Again, our buyer's package is uh, right here in the photos folder, which will be sent to you after this. Um, here's another super unique and cool project. And uh, when you were talking, Kyle, about um, that motel conversion that you were doing, it actually kind of reminded me of this one. Like uh, you could you could do something like those executive suites in this property. So this is super unique. It's 550 and um, that assignment fee is included. And to actually the upstairs is a rooming house. And so there's seven rooms and then this back area has a one bedroom apartment. So it's uh, basically six or sorry, four of the bedrooms are, are currently rented. And then that, that back apartment is also currently rented. And with those rents, it's already cash flowing. Um, now you could definitely rent out the other three rooms and have it cash flowing even more while you're doing renovations. So that downstairs used to be an old bar and, uh, What's happening here with this property is we already have drawings already done up for an eightplex conversion. So that would be to bachelor apartments, eight of them. Um, so actually, well, seven bachelor apartments and then one one bedroom apartment in the back there and a ton of upsides. So this kind of split commercial residential has permits already and approval by the city to be a completely 100% residential building. So lots of opportunity here. And I have some really great um, numbers here for you to look through, but I just wanna show um, some comparables. So this property on Lincoln Street, it's uh, not too far away. It actually used to be a fourplex and then the owner turned it into an eightplex. So it's getting for all eight of the bachelor units, 11, uh, 1100 basically, uh, or a little bit more than that in some of them per unit. And that just sold uh, in the past 180 days for 1.149 million. So at 550, you're going to come in, do some renovations, convert all of these units, a ton of upside. If you wanted to just completely flip this and, and resell it on market, there's great potential there, or you could hold on to it and have a great cash flowing, high performing building. So lots of photos here for you to take a look at. Uh, again, I'll send these out uh, after. And we're actually doing the walkthrough on King Street. That's going to be on Friday. Uh, we have another few here. So this is in Barrie. The walkthrough on this one is Thursday, so tomorrow. So this is a single family with a secondary suite. It's currently uh, just being rented by students. It is coming vac vacant on possession. So huge bonus there because you can go in and do some renovations and uh, just completely burr this out. So this is going for 630. And uh, really, you just want to go in and do some strategic renovations with this one, um, as there, there's a fantastic opportunity. Now, there's actually technically right now five bedrooms, but that's it used to be six bedrooms. The owner just combined two of the rooms to have it a little bit more open concept. So you could definitely, you know, put up a wall and have it be a six bed again. There's two bathrooms, um, full like kitchen downstairs in that secondary suite. If you wanted to convert this into a duplex, there is an opportunity for you to do that. You would have to do um, like all of the, the coating and, and fire wall, et cetera, everything that you basically need to do for it to be a legal duplex anyways, but it's already kitted out with a kitchen down there, bathroom, bedroom. So you just need to put up a, a door to, or a, 
a wall really to separate it out. There's a, a door going to that, that basement. Um, so great opportunity here. Fantastic comparable sales as well. So legal duplex 260 meters away at 690. Um, and then here's a, a single family with an unfinished basement for, for 682. And then this one, um, this is a single family with a secondary suite. So this is uh, just a little bit bigger and it's going for 851. So this location too, it's right downtown Barrie. So really close to Heritage uh, Park if you're familiar with Barrie and it's got all of the amenities. Like I think this might be the longest amenity list that I've written so far, just cause it's literally right downtown. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, okay. Final one here is uh, that we have a full package for anyways, I have a surprise building that I'm going to be talking about too. So uh, this is our uh, one 117 Murray Street in Wallaceburg. This is a nice little lipstick flip or whole tail. So this is another um, single fan with a secondary suite downstairs. It's going for 226, uh, closing date March 10th. So it's another one that comes vacant on possession. And again, we're doing walkthroughs on this one tomorrow. So we actually have several properties with walkthroughs tomorrow. So walkthroughs tomorrow is Murray Street. Uh, we have Barry as well, a walkthrough. Uh, Glencoe as well has a walkthrough. And then this walkthrough for King Street is, is on Friday. So the final property that I'm going to talk to you guys about here is actually an eight plex and it's in Hanover. So this one just came under contract today. So I don't have a, a nice package to show you uh, with every every piece of information done up, but it's uh, it's got six residential and two commercial. It's priced at 575 for the eight plex. Uh, the, the wholesale fees are already included in that. And uh, it's well priced at 72K per unit. Uh, so the last few like multifamilies that we had at that size went very quickly. In the past 10 days, we've assigned three of them. So we've been pumping out these larger apartment buildings and larger multifamilies. So this one's just come under contract. We're still working on um, putting together that information for you. We'll do a little financial breakdown and um, ensure that you guys have all the information, but I'll give you guys the sneak peek is that that one is coming up. It just came under contract today. So if you guys have any questions about any of the private deals, make sure you hit me up after today's chat. And one reminder too is just to throw some, some love at us, throw some feedback and, and let us know what you want to hear. So we actually take your feedback very seriously and we build out the topics for our webinars based off of what you guys want to hear. So make sure that you fill this out. This is literally the entirety of the survey. It takes you two seconds to do. Um, and I'll send you the link following today's webinar. Um, but again, Kyle Ford, thank you so much for coming on. It is always such a pleasure, man. Like I always learn so much on these webinars when you're on them. You have so many little golden nuggets to take away. I, I actually recently rewatched the one that uh, we did together back uh, a, a couple months ago now, but uh, you have such like killer knowledge. I remember you talked about the red herring move and uh, how you're negotiating some of these deals. So again, if you haven't watched that uh, webinar or weren't on uh, live with us for the first one, make sure you jump over to, to Adam's YouTube channel. You can find that at Adam GD Martin on YouTube. He's been pumping out a lot of videos this year in 2021. So make sure you uh, pop over there and give us a follow, give us a little shout out on Instagram and we will give you some love back. So Kyle, thank you so much for joining us on today's today's webinar. I'll flip it over to, to you, Kyle, just to uh, say a, your last few words here and then Adam can give us a little uh, send off. Thanks for having me, really appreciate it. Uh, always love connecting with you guys and hearing what you got going on. Uh, make sure I'm on top of that list, especially in Grand Bend. Um, Guys, get out there, buy as many of these things as you, as you can, as fast as you can. Uh, there's tons of opportunity in this business right now. I'll tell you, we are, uh, I have to look, 80 to 90% sold out for the summer. So if you're wondering if you buy now, can you still rent it out this summer? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you can. So best of luck. Do some deals. Thanks for having me on and uh, keep killing it, guys.
Yeah, that's that's wicked, Kyle. Thank you so much. I do appreciate it. And everybody that stayed on right till the end, I do appreciate you guys as well. Uh, there's still 50 of you here, so that's fantastic. Um, I do hope that you'll see us again next week. We have one of these every single Wednesday, so the topics change every week. So next week will be something totally different, probably nothing to do at all with Airbnb or short-term rentals. Uh, but what we're doing here and what we're trying to accomplish is just more general awareness in the market about some of the strategies that have worked for us and some of the people in our network. So people like Kyle are out there, you know, normal dudes who are just executing on great strategies and then repeating the process as often as possible. That's who's becoming really successful at times, you know, like right now where we've got a lot of people at home uh, just kicking pebbles and, and kicking dirt here and, and not really having a great time. I'm just here to tell you guys it's okay. Okay, it's okay to be successful right now. And there's lots of people out there doing it. Um, and, and these are some of the ways that we are doing it right now, right? It's, it's, it's smart investing strategies and then actually taking action. Okay, so I'd invite any of you, my last piece of, uh, of advice for the night is just pick up the damn phone, okay? Actually get to work, get to work calling people, get in front of lenders, get in front of properties, get in front of leads, whether off market or on market. Talk to realtors, talk to mortgage agents, talk to contractors, whomever you need to talk to to move forward and get closer to actually doing something, actually taking action uh, on any strategy is going to put you in a better place. Okay, real estate's a really forgiving industry and it's really not about, you know, there's a classic adage in real estate, it's not about timing the market, it's about time in the market. Okay, so the sooner you guys can actually work to take action, the better the results you're going to have. Okay, it's kind of a dollar cost averaging uh, strategy here. If you get in now, you know, chances are if you hold on to the thing, it's going to be worth more in the future. Okay, and that's what I've just benefited from. I've actually just sold all my properties. I'm happy as hell, cashed out, tons of liquidity now. And what I'm going to do is just be looking for more strategic opportunities for buildings I can add strategic value to. Okay, so that's what guys like myself are doing who are having a lot of success in this space. So if you haven't got a start yet on any of this, just pick up the damn phone. That is the only piece of advice I can give you that is actually useful. It's just actually start taking action towards moving that goal. Um, and then at some point, you can do bigger deals like this. Okay, I don't think the cottage Airbnb is your first deal, primarily because of its cash requirements. You're going to actually require either decent connections to private capital or tons of equity in an existing um, space or lots of cash, whatever that may look like. If it is your first investment, go back and replay this. Okay, I'm going to post this youtube.com slash Adam JD Martin. Whole thing's going to be there unedited. You can go through and watch it. Uh, and listen to all of uh, Kyle's words of wisdom and, and, and just repeat it for yourself. Now, if you're into some other strategies, go back as well to that channel. There's a lot of our other previous webinars there where you can go back, even if you want to learn more about Airbnb stuff or short-term rentals, excuse me, for cottages, go back, listen to Kyle's last talk, okay? It's on there. You can go back and watch it and, uh, and, and hear everything else we had to say. So anyways, Thank you so much, guys, for tuning in. We will see you next week at 6 p.m. And you can look forward to us bringing you a new topic, a new speaker, or maybe just us. You never know. You might get stuck with us, heaven forbid. Uh, <laughs> and then we'll also be bringing you, uh, it's my commitment to bringing you more private deals at the end of that webinar. So uh, don't cheat. No tuning in at the last five minutes just to see what deals we got. Uh, we usually have a cool speaker and you can learn something as well. So thank you guys so much. Don't forget to tag us, post about it and spread the good word. And then, uh, yeah, we'll see you next Wednesday. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks for coming, guys.